Good morning to, to all of you. As I was mentioning before, it's a, a pleasure to be here with all of you today, with all the participants, all the panelists. Today we are discussing uh, uh, a truly important topic, which is the future of health systems and sustainability. Uh, the session of today is called Young European Voices, and I'm very happy to, that it's called this way because it brings together a community of young people, a community of experts with a variety of stories of different experiences in the health and the innovation sector. Uh, and uh, we bring together this community with uh, a series of high level decision makers and politicians. So this is truly something remarkable. All these people are willing to engage with one another. Uh, and what I like very much is that all this is done for the betterment of uh, our European Union and our health system. Uh, I present myself, uh, my name is Alessandro Lerold. Today, I have the pleasure of uh, uh, facilitating such an interesting discussion, which happens under the umbrella of the European Health Forum Gastein. Um, before diving into the conversation and present to you all the uh, panelists, the distinguished speakers we have today, uh, let me thank, first of all, all the youth organizations behind this fantastic digital event. Uh, you see them at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there are so many. This is uh, the first time uh, uh, that I know of that so many youth organizations get together and they try to create uh, an opportunity for change. Uh, and also let me thank MSD and Johnson & Johnson for enabling such, such opportunity. Uh, without further ado, I would like uh, to present to you uh, the different panelists. We have Michele, I, go, I will go in order here. Uh, Michele Calabro, uh, policy advisor at the European Patients Forum. Uh, we were having a joke during uh, <laughs> the pre site Michele as, a, as such a polyedric person. He's also a member of the Young Coalition for Prevention and Vac Vaccination. He's also a young Steiner. So Michele, uh, you have uh, so, many, so many titles that it's gonna be fun to, to combine all of them. And Michele today is gonna talk uh, about uh, prevention uh, with a focus on the patient's per perspective, which is, you know, the core of what everything we do here. Hi, Michele. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks, then uh, we're joined uh, by Evelina Kutsubowska. Uh, Evelina is a young professional here in Brussels. Uh, she participated to the European Health Parliament uh, of this year edition. Fantastic initiative bringing together 60 young professionals uh, they do policy recommendations for the European Commission, for the European Parliament, uh, and they do a fantastic work. Evelina was uh, a distinguished member of the Interconnected Care Committee, and today is going to talk about the digital side of the healthcare system. Good morning, Evelina. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. Thank you, Alessandro, and good morning, everyone. Super. And then, of course, uh, uh, I would like to present to you and to welcome Signe Razzo, Deputy Director General for uh, Research and Innovation of the European Commission. Signe, not many words <laughs> for you because uh, your, uh, your experience talks uh, by itself. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, everyone. And of course, uh, I'm truly happy also to welcome uh, a member of the European Parliament, Susanna Solis Perez. Uh, Susanna is uh, a member of the European Parliament. She sits uh, in uh, Environment and Health Committee as a substitute. And then, of course, she's one of the members of the European Parliament sitting in the AI Expert Group. I'm sure you will have a lot to talk about uh, uh, with Signe, Evelina and Michele, especially on, uh, on digital. Hi, Susanna. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good morning to all of you. Fantastic. So having done this, a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, uh, kindly, if you're not one of the panelists, uh, uh, please keep your mic and camera off for the first part of the session. We will dive in into the second one where all of you will, uh, will uh, speak with each other. If you're interested, there is a Twitter handle. So the conversation is happening there. Uh, it's called United Young Voices. So this is the hashtag. Uh, of course, all the participants, uh, uh, please uh, uh, put your questions on the chat. We will reserve the final part uh, of uh, this conversation to ask your questions to Signe, Michele, Evelina, uh, and of course, Susanna. Um, and having said that, let's dive in. Uh, first of all, we will start with a couple of videos. It's two short videos, one on pre prevention and the second one on digital. We will hear from Biele, who is the president of the European Health Parliament of this edition. And then we will hear on digital from Cecilia, who is the managing director at the Digital Europe. 
warm welcome to the Young European Voices session at the European Health Forum Gestein. My name is Biala Roberts and I'm president of the European Health Parliament representing 60 young professionals covering all parts of the healthcare sector. Today's public health crisis has shown the importance of resilience. And resilience means that our health systems are able to prepare, manage, adapt and learn from shocks and disruptions that may occur. This can be quantified in, for example, ensuring sustainable infrastructures, substantial financing in public health, but also political will, political leadership, and for example, empowered citizens. However, the COVID-19 situation has demonstrated a lack of resilience within European healthcare systems. Patients are experiencing delay or even missing out on their treatments, and immunization coverage rates are lacking behind due to disruptions. There is a large focus on the pandemic itself, but low appreciation on the risks and impacts associated with, for example, a larger number of unvaccinated people. Healthcare systems are very interconnected and in order for it to be resilient, all parts of the health system have to be resilient. Otherwise, it will amplify the problem as we see now with COVID-19, increased misinformation and increased vaccine hesitancy. We need to make sure all parts of the system are able to adapt to evolving landscapes and make sure they understand public health needs. Especially now with increased global health threats, demographic changes and the added pressure that we are experiencing on our health systems, it's really important that we develop a long-term vision. And within this vision, prevention should be a key pillar because prevention is such a valuable investment. We need to make sure the population is protected to ensure productivity, but also, for example, to decrease hospitalization costs. Right now we have the opportunity for renewal and right now we need to make sure we shift from healthcare systems to health systems. And that's why I'm very excited and I'm very proud that today the Young Voices are joining the debate to engage with the policymakers, but also with you, the audience, to discuss Europe of the future making sure it is resilient and sustainable, really using the power of prevention and the power of digitalization. I'm very much looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cecilia bonefeld uh, I am the Director General of Digital Europe. We uh, represent 35,000 digitalizing businesses here in Europe. And I'm here to talk a little bit about digital and healthcare. There is no doubt that the future of healthcare is digital and uh, the innovation will be to a large extent based on data. Um, that will need a lot of investment, new skills, new innovation methods, usage of AI and not least access to data. Today, 80% of all healthcare data remains unstructured and unused and only 3% of the European countries have actually adopted a European electronic health record. This will require a big focus on a harmonized efforts from the member states on implementation of an electronic health record, but also on pushing for cross-border data flows. This will not only lead to innovations, like for example that clinical trials will be able to be collapsed from three years to 20 days, or that would normally would take a year to analyze of data will take a split second by usage of AI. This is exactly where we need to go. We have all seen what speed really means for health, especially during these COVID times. So I would say, let's release the potential of data for the benefit of the patients and the citizens. We all need that ecosystem of innovative healthcare for the future and for the future generations. And I hope that you will have a really good conversation today, a dialogue with concrete examples and concrete ideas on how to move that forward and how we in five years can be in a situation where all countries have implemented the electronic health record and that where AI is widely used for the benefits of patients. Have a great discussion, have a great day. Fantastic. Uh, we've had a couple of inputs, a lot of uh, information, a lot of interesting uh, starting points for our discussion. Uh, I will start with Michele, then Evelina, then Signe, and then Susanna. 
Um, as uh, we would like to start really with the young perspective and then hear the remarks uh, of uh, the policymakers. So Michele, we've heard from Biele, we've heard uh, from, uh, you know, the fact that resilience is a truly important aspect of today's discussion, especially after the pandemic. My question to you uh, would be, as a young professional, uh, as a, an expert in this field, what are the lessons learned from the period of a hardship that we have just experienced through COVID? Thank you, Michele. Thank, thank you, Alessandro. And uh, well, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks of course, for having me during this, this conversation. It's really, it's really exciting to, to be here, especially being part of some of these groups. So it's, it's quite nice to see how we're all coming together. Um, I think the point on uh, uh, on what did we learn from uh, from this COVID crisis? It, it's absolutely it's absolutely fundamental. I think that uh, the first thing that the crisis shown and its global dimension is how we really need to look at uh, uh, at healthcare in a different way, in a more shared, common and holistic way, in a way, and how especially of course at European level for us, but it has a global dimension as well. Uh, how we should really look at uh, how we can build better and more resilient health systems together. Um, healthcare is clearly something that we cannot tackle on an individual basis. And we're also going to talk about digitalization and data, and that's, that's another example. Um, another point, I think uh, we, we did learn a lot from the pandemic, but actually the pandemic itself exposed a lot of uh, already known issues. Um, shortages uh, is an example, the lack again of harmonized data and, and a harmonized way to look at innovation, gaps in terms of access, uh, uh, gaps in terms of uh, health literacy and empowerment and all of this. It's not something new, but it's, it's really something that the COVID crisis uh, exposed once again and all elements of how the health system could really uh, be built on that. And therefore, I think uh, Again, another learning that is connected to this is that we were really not starting from an ideal situation. It is therefore what we should look at is really try to learn from this COVID crisis and try to advance and not just repair our health system for better resilience. I think that is a, it's, it's a crucial point uh, and it touches a lot of elements of, of resilience. The health system should be to be better, to be uh, more prepared to tackle similar challenges, but also to deal with the existing challenges. They should be more inclusive, uh, uh, innovating, but also empowerment, uh, empowering and really reflecting in a way the needs of citizen patients and of course also healthcare professionals. And uh, um, we really see a lot of political momentum going on around healthcare now. We saw it during the State of the Union, President von der Leyen, we saw with numerous calls for a European Health Union and a strong EU for Health program. I think now is really uh, the time where we cannot avoid to lose the opportunity that we have from this COVID crisis and advance together for, for better health systems and prevention indeed. Uh, and maybe we're going to talk a little bit more about it later, but it's prevention and all the related measures from vaccines to screening really play a fundamental role in this. Thank you. Thank you, Michele. Uh, indeed, I have the feeling that uh, both uh, the European Parliament, the European Commission, and in general at European level, we, we live under the motto, never waste uh, a crisis. So of course we are in a time of hardship, but let's take some lessons learned from this. So, so thank you for your contribution. And then the other side of the coin, Evelina, of course, uh, uh, it strikes me when we heard uh, Cecilia earlier during the video mentioning that 80% of health data nowadays are not structured and used in a, in a structured and European way. So from your perspective, uh, uh, can, you, can you tell us more, Evelina, on how you see the future as a young professional in this sense? Very last minor thing, please, uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, there is a Twitter hashtag, you see it at the bottom, feel free to use it. Thank you, Alessandro, and thank you for having me here. I'm glad to have an opportunity to represent the Interconnected Care Committee here in the uh, European Health Parliament. And so I'll briefly take this opportunity to present our um, recommendations that we uh, came together. So, uh, well, our recommendations go much more into depth around the issues of cross-border healthcare and are centered around three pillars, so citizen empowerment, healthcare professional skills, and digital technologies. Um, today I'll focus on digital health, uh, but I will share later on the link to the recommendations so you can, uh, you can read it. 
So when it comes to digital health, um, it's not a new topic in the EU. Um, however, now it became a big priority for the European Commission and this pandemic demonstrated that now it's the most timely time to talk about it. So um, indeed we need to think how we can make our healthcare systems more sustainable and eventually more resilient and more perhaps cost effective as well. Um, I think that this pandemic showed us the value of blended healthcare systems and the opportunities it brings as well in ensuring more accessible healthcare services for all European citizens. Um, we see that many countries already stepped up and accelerated the use of um, electronic uh, health records and so on. So we need to sustain this and further develop it. In this context, um, I think that's important to th take three uh, key considerations when we, it comes to digital health. So first, it's very important and fundamental absolutely is to ensure the creation of reliable, reliable health data sharing infrastructure. So it will be necessary to make sure that we have interpretable and operating infrastructure. Uh, we heard already from the presentation that very few countries are already sharing some uh, summaries and e-prescriptions, but we need to step back. We need to make sure that all types of data is um, being shared, uh, not only prescriptions. Then next, when we have all this fundamental um, infrastructure, uh, what it comes, we need to make sure that all this data is accessible. The reliable infrastructure should enable seamless um, information sharing from, from one storage to another. Um, and this means we need to ensure that data is fair. So fair principles, findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability of data. And only then it will be possible for healthcare professionals and institutions to, to make sense and utilize this data. Um, another challenge uh, which we find is a trust. This is very tricky and the most difficult perhaps building citizen trust in a technology because we can have all the types of the infrastructure and being able to share the data, but if we do not have citizen trust, uh, it will uh, simply not work. And therefore it will be very important and it will require data protection. We have already robust GDPR and e-privacy directives aimed at ensuring high level of personal data protection and and security, but it will be crucial to guarantee that this data protection legislation is perceived as enabling citizen trust, not as an obstacle to progress. So indeed, uh, it's, it's really timely, this conversation now. It's important for us, I believe, to not lose the opportunity and to draw some learnings from, from the situation it have, to bring together all the voices, so all these young voices, um, and ensure that our healthcare systems are more resilient, are better prepared for the future challenges. Um, and therefore, my message is here to, to really look into this, you know, what we can do here in terms of the infrastructure accessibility, but also building the trust of people who will actually make sense and use this data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelina. And uh, I, I pick on your last point to go to, to Signe, which is, uh, we hear a lot uh, citizens, we hear, hear a lot uh, united voices. So everything we do is obviously for the citizens, for European citizens in this case. And we've seen uh, in the past uh, uh, months uh, uh, a variety of great examples from uh, people, uh, from professionals, from just uh, very kind communities, uh, both in innovation, in social aspects. Signe, um, your first reaction to what uh, Evelina and Michele uh, have said, and also what, why do you believe, uh, if, if so, that is important to have an holistic approach and include everyone in this case? Uh, well, many thanks, Alessandro, for your kind introduction, and, uh, and many thanks for, for two of these uh, introductory uh, interventions. Um, I, I really listened carefully to those and also what was expressed uh, during uh, the, the video. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear about uh, the importance of citizens as um, citizen engagement is one uh, of my responsibilities as Deputy Director General uh, in uh, the Director General of Research and Innovation namely in research and innovation policies. But I'm, I'm also very glad to um, uh, participate in this session, uh, which has been organized by several um, organizations of the youth, because throughout time, youth movements have had great impact on some societal issues. For example, climate change and the sustainability of the health resources. Uh, we've also seen that the young generation is much more sensitive 
uh, about the future of our planet, which is also natural. And uh, for instance, my own children are a good example in this regard. My daughter, for instance, always reminds me of the need to consume less, more sustainably. And my son is a young researcher who is looking for ways how to make hydrogen and fuel cells as alternative energy sources more affordable, more affordable uh, for, for everyone. Uh, now, you as uh, the young generation uh, are also the reason why at the European level we have set up the EU Youth Strategy, uh, which is the framework for EU youth policy cooperation until 2027. Uh, and EU youth cooperation shall make the most of youth uh, policies potential uh, because it fosters youth participation in democratic life, it also supports social and civil engagement and aims to ensure that all young people have the necessary resources to participate in society. So clearly Europe and its future needs you. Uh, the European Commission is highly motivated uh, to get the next uh, generation a stage and a voice uh, in the shaping of the future of the EU and our way of life, including EU health and care systems, which we are discussing here today. Uh, you know that the EU will soon be launching a two-year debate uh, called the Conference on the Future of Europe for all the citizens of the EU to discuss together what kind of future we want for the continent to live in. And clearly the uh, younger generations must be present there to let their voices to be heard. Uh, now, there has been a lot of discussion already today here about digital means, how digital means, digital tools uh, can uh, also enhance uh, the, the healthcare systems. And clearly, we've, we've uh, seen it uh, very clearly demonstrated during the COVID crisis. If I think about my um, home country, Estonia, which is uh, really quite advanced in digital means, also in the healthcare sector, it was a, a great, um, uh, actually, uh, asset during the COVID crisis to have the digital means like digital prescriptions, so you don't need to go physically to the doctor to get your prescriptions and, and other tools. But now, uh, if we look into the future, uh, as you know, uh, Europe's digital future is one of the main priorities of the Commission. And uh, there we need your help to ensure that the European approach to digital transformation means empowering, means including every citizen, uh, also strengthening the potential of every business and meeting global challenges with our core values. Uh, Europe's digital strategy is about technology that works for people. Uh, it means a fair and competitive digital economy an open, democratic and sustainable digital society, but also about Europe as a global digital player, which is committed to setting global standards for emerging technologies and at the same time most, uh, remaining the most open region for trade and investment in the world. And who else but the youth uh, is to lead this transformation, making sure that no one is uh, left behind. And uh, when it comes to the future, I firmly believe that research and innovation are critical levers to ensure a sustainable and inclusive recovery. They hold the promise to boost the resilience uh, of our production sectors. The resilience was clearly very uh, much mentioned already earlier, but also it will boost uh, the competitiveness of our economy and the transformation of our socio-economic systems and it's especially in the field of research and innovation where youth such as young professionals and young citizens must play a central uh, role. Uh, just I'd like to give a concrete example here. Over the summer we worked with the European Youth Forum to hear what young people like you uh, from across Europe want us to set as priorities for innovation in the fields of climate change, soil health, smart and green cities, cancer and oceans. For each of these areas, we will now have a mission, like uh, the mission to put a man on the moon in the past. Uh, and I spoke to people like you 
uh, to help to define these missions. Well, clearly, because of the restrictions due to COVID-19, these were mostly held digitally, but nevertheless, uh, it enabled uh, to listen to, to many people, including the, the youth. Now, during this co-creation uh, of these missions, uh, re really we've uh, established very good cooperation with the Youth Forum, and we'll also count on all of you, your help, to achieve the impact that we are looking for with our Horizon missions. Uh, this is clearly not enough, as COVID-19 pandemic has made it all the pressing for all of us to come together and to decide what world we want to live in post-COVID-19. Thank you very absolutely, much. Absolutely, absolutely, Signia. It's, um, I think you, you touched upon uh, upon a series of, uh, of uh, truly interesting conversation, and I can already tell you uh, on behalf of the young uh, experts and young professionals that are here that we, of course, will like uh, to make our voice heard for the next conference on the on the European future of Europe. Uh, and now. Um, I would like uh, to, to pass the floor to Susanna. Susanna, um, as a, first of all, thank you for being here. As a member of the European Parliament, uh, uh, you have an holistic approach. Of course, you represent uh, Spain, but you also represent all European citizens, uh, young, uh, less young, uh, from uh, all over, over Europe. Um, I would like to ask you, we have heard from uh, uh, the side of prevention, uh, so vaccination is going to be very important. We've heard from the side of uh, digital. They are the two sides of the same coin. What is uh, uh, your view on the future and how can Europe truly make an impact in this sense? Thank you, Alexander. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the wonderful speakers that are a part of this panel today, but especially I would like to thank the organizers, um, all the young people that are here today to discuss such an important topic. In the middle of the second wave of this terrible crisis, there is no better moment to speak about our healthcare systems. And I think uh, that it is crucial to engage all members of society in this conversation, but especially young people. These uncertain times show that now more than ever, policymakers need to collaborate with young people in order to build a brighter and more inspiring future for Europe. And in the year I have been a member of the European Parliament, I have seen major shifts in the way we envision health and the importance of promoting stronger, stronger relations between the different member states. I have seen how all stakeholders have engaged in deep conversations about this topic from all perspectives, but I think they all agreed in one point. We must rely on digital tools and innovation to overcome the unknown challenges that may arise and to create more resilient healthcare systems. Uh, Cecilia said in the video, the future of health is digital. I fully agree. Uh, the, the potential of digitalization is enormous. And uh, it also, um, and it means uh, that uh, we have to, to, to make sure that uh, our priorities as policymakers uh, are, are, are engaged. Um, I, I would like to highlight our priorities. Uh, first, uh, access to data. I don't want to repeat what has been already said, but it is one of the main tasks assigned to Commissioner Kiriakides, and it is very challenging because we, as you know, health data is stored in a number of separate and often in, uh, incompatible silos. But imagine, for example, uh, the implementation of the interoperable electronic health uh, records it would uh, ensure that citizens can securely access and exchange their health data whenever they are in the EU and reduce uh, costs. Second thing we need is a clear regulatory framework. We are all convinced of the potential of AI, but AI must be reliable, must be transparent and trustworthy. And it means a legislation that managed to achieve a balance between respecting our European values, privacy and data protection and also an innovative environment that encourages uh, the creation of groundbreaking solutions. Third, upskilling. So without qualified professionals, we will not be able to advance. We have to increase the specialization on digital skills of health professionals, ensuring that all our researchers and medical professionals are up to speed in the last advances. And this means investing in lifelong education and providing more funds to the educational system. And finally, more funding and investment for innovation. 
it is necessary to ensure that programs such as Horizon Europe and Digital Europe have sufficient resources. And as you know, as you know now in the Parliament, we are renegotiating with the Council to increase the budget of these programs as far as possible. It is important to provide the necessary resources in infrastructure to facilitate the 5G, European data centers, and uh, we have just approved a very important investment in European supercomputers. So many areas in progress need to be funded. And just to mention, let's make sure that the public-private partnerships work in order to fund all, all this, uh, uh, all this uh, digitalization and innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I, I would like to take a part of what you just said uh, to, to, to kick off the conversation. We have about 15, 20 minutes for conversation. We'll also wait for a, a few questions to, to come in through the chat box. Um, I would like to, to ask uh, Evelina, you know, uh, Evelina, you've been working for now um, more than a year on, uh, with the European Health Parliament. Uh, uh, on policy recommendations, you know, and we have talked, uh, uh, Signe and, and Susanna talked about the importance of digital, but also the importance of uh, how citizens, how much citizens believe uh, and trust in this digital, uh, in this digital revolution. Uh, do you have any, any suggestion for policymakers on how to frame it in a best way? How to, you know, make sure that uh, uh, the citizen is believing in what he sees and that also that data are shared uh, between cross-borders? Yeah, thank you, Alessandro. Um, Indeed, uh, as I mentioned, our recommendations focused on three pillars, so also citizen empowerment and uh, healthcare professionals uh, skills training. Because at the end, uh, no matter you know, what data we create, what, what, what technologies we have, if we are not able to understand, to know how to use it, and we cannot trust this, um, it, it will be useless. So, um, you know, current situation has already changed, the, the, I believe, the traditional working of, of healthcare field. So we already stepping there, you know, we were already one step forward. However, it will be really important to ensure that, you know, citizens, they, they feel that they know what's happening with their data, they know how, how the data is being used. Um, in our recommendations, we suggested having um, interoperable EIDs and as well interface where citizens would be able to access the data to see what, what the data is there and to decide and to give a permission on the use of this data. So involving first of all citizens in the conversation with the policymakers, having this conversations that's happening today, involving young citizen um, in this, but also getting the broader perspectives from broader stakeholder groups, um, it will be really important and key in shaping these policies. Um, also healthcare professionals, understanding their needs, because at the end healthcare professionals will be the ones who will need to understand and to make sense of the data. Um, so making sure that they, they know what they're talking about, that they know how to use and that they feel empowered and uh, knowledgeable about how to use this data. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I see Michele, Michele wanting to come in on this. Michele, uh, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can, uh, uh, I can, I can only uh, reinforce what what Evelina was saying. It's uh, uh, empowering citizens and patients is absolutely is absolutely fundamental. Not only not only for digital, but uh, uh, to improve our system resilience uh, in in a more general sense. Uh, for sure, um, you know, investing on health literacy, investing on education for healthcare professionals, for citizens and patients. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a part of creating also this trust uh, uh, for, for the digitalization of health systems, but again, in general, for, for better health systems uh, uh, as, as a whole, because of course, uh, uh, empowered citizens and patients are more, uh, are better able to understand health measures, uh, and we see in it in, in this COVID crisis, uh, uh, it can improve self-management, it can improve the way you collaborate with, uh, uh, you collaborate in your dialogue with healthcare professionals, and indeed, uh, if it's true that, uh, uh, you know, uh, literacy part has uh, uh, play a fundamental, play a fundamental role, uh, we cannot forget uh, about the co-design as well uh, of, uh, of digitalization and innovation with, uh, uh, with citizen patients. So dialogues like today and, you know, connecting with uh, 
uh, you know, patient group, young patient groups, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely fundamental because there's a richness of, uh, of knowledge, of understanding of uh, uh, their own diseases that uh, um, it's, nowhere, it's nowhere else to be found. So absolutely, I can, uh, uh, I'm really happy to hear that this uh, openness in involving, uh, you know, patient, patient and citizens uh, from, from, from the very, very beginning. And, uh, and on this uh, signal, I would like to, to, to pass to you the hot potato, if you want. I would like to ask you, you know, um, of course, we talk about uh, how to involve citizens, how to involve young citizens. Um, and uh, also, Evelina touched upon the importance, uh, you know, that uh, we need to upskill, as well as Susanna, we need to upskill, we need to get really in the 21st century with a series of innovations uh, on research. Um, how is the Commission planning to do so? Uh, do you think it's a question of communication? So the Commission should be, you know, really getting out there and making sure that uh, inputs are coming in and are taken into consideration? Uh, do you think it's a question of money, so we need to invest more? What can, uh, you know, everyone else do to help the Commission reach this point? Uh, well, first of all, let me touch upon the, the data and the open data issue, uh, which was also raised in the, in the discussion. Uh, you know that in research and innovation uh, area, we have the policy of open data. Uh, and clearly, uh, when already at the very outset uh, of, the, um, uh, of the COVID crisis, uh, we already um, launched extraordinary calls uh, uh, in order to, to get uh, the solutions uh, for the treatments, um, uh, also for the, uh, for the tests. Uh, um, and uh, these calls, uh, both in the research area, as well as in the innovation areas as part of the European Innovation Council, uh, actually resulted uh, in the results, which are now open to everyone. I think this is very important to, to keep in mind. Uh, but now, uh, really, how to, uh, how to include citizens and especially how to include uh, young uh, voices and experts uh, in this uh, conversation, I think that also during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, youth already played a big role uh, in supporting crisis management. We've seen that they were really uh, active in designing the masks, uh, in designing uh, health equipment, uh, which was um, in need, uh, uh, especially at the outset of the crisis, when also there were deficiencies. Uh, but they also uh, helped elderly in need of care. They came out with um, uh, new solutions, social innovation cases, as we call them, uh, organized hackathons uh, to deliver urgently needed innovative solutions. I can uh, recall, for instance, Hack the Crisis Hackathon, uh, that was organized in my home country, Estonia, already uh, in mid-March, uh, and which later led to pan-European hackathon, uh, EU versus crisis, which was done in cooperation with the European Commission, and which in the end was not only pan-European, uh, but, but global, because uh, there were uh, the startup companies uh, which, uh, um, which uh, participated from all over the world. And this is the beauty of using the, uh, the digital means. Uh, now, clearly, uh, now looking forward, uh, the young citizen professionals uh, can and should play also an important role uh, in the adoption of innovative solutions in healthcare uh, delivery, such as the use of telemedicine uh, for long distance medical appointments or the use of mo mobile apps now for COVID 19 contact tracing. Um, and as policymakers, um, young professionals can also make sure that the specific needs uh, of your generation are taken on board uh, when designing future proof systems. Uh, but also that other generations are listened to, that also the, uh, the interests of the elderly are taken uh, into account. Uh, you have actually the advantage to have a more robust digital health literacy than the previous generations. And that's why you can really help to design, to shape and test their technologies uh, of uh, uh, tomorrow in order to make them more uh, efficient. And as, as consumers and payers, you can actually shape the markets of health and care service delivery and technological uh, innovations. 
So, and this is really the, the spirit of uh, inclusivity, uh, inclusive, uh, inclusiveness uh, and access to health and care to everyone, affordability uh, so that no one will be left behind. I think this is the, the real a true European spirit, which we will take into account in all policy areas, including in uh, research and innovation and healthcare systems. And uh, on the European spirit, I guess, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, definitely someone that can speak on that. And uh, I would like to ask Susanna uh, something on this. Um, Susanna, one year in the European Parliament, uh, um, we have a lot of young people, not necessarily all young professionals in this, uh, sorry, younger, younger healthcare professionals in this, in this conversation. Um, could you give uh, them and us uh, an insight of what is the best way to help a member of the European Parliament and then tell us how receptive is the European Parliament to young voices? Uh, what are the tips and tricks on, on uh, making your voice heard? So uh, I think if we can take something positive from this crisis is that uh, it has shown us the path uh, that we have seen the in time of crisis, we must rely on each other and we, may be, we, we should be united in adversity. It, it also the importance of the, of the innovation as, as uh, we see also, but, um, but it has also highlighted uh, that we something that we should never forget is the importance of investing in the future and investing in the future generations. And I think Europe can lead this process now of uh, digitalization uh, and we have to count with all the stakeholders, as we mentioned before. Uh, we have many challenges uh, before us and policymakers need to be in constant uh, uh, contact uh, with, the, with the young people. I think now it is time for younger generations to take a stand and let us know what future you want, how you want future societies to look, and how to protect the most vulnerable. I think it is now time for the, for the young people, as I mentioned before, to build the, this future uh, Europe we, we want to, to, to do together. Um, I think in this time, uh, during this time, uh, the European Union provides uh, European solutions to many, to many challenges, uh, uh, but we have, uh, we have sure is that we need cross-sectoral and cross-border cooperation and collaboration in Europe. And here, the, the youth, it's uh, what we need to, uh, we need them to help us in the, in, in as policymakers. Fantastic. So unfortunately, the conversation is super interesting, but we are running out of time because, of course, I want to um, put the emphasis on the second part of today, which is going to be truly working groups working on what we have just discussed. So I would like to ask to Evelina, Michele, Signe and Susanna in 60 seconds. So very short appeal. Uh, one takeaway from this conversation. Evelina, we start with you. Um, thank you, Alessandra. Thank you for this um, great conversation. So my key takeaway would be that, you know, it's, it's, it's really time now to harness the potential of, of COVID. I, I believe everyone will say that. And we cannot see all the different parts as functioning separately, but in one conjunction. So we need to make sure that we have everything, infrastructure, possibility to carry data and will on trust. And so uh, not forget the citizen in young voices, um, especially. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Evelina. Michele, 60 seconds. Hard, but <laughs> I will try. Um, I think the, 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 the one sentence is, uh, we need to build better health systems, uh, uh, speaking with those who are involved in it, from, from citizens, patients, to healthcare professionals, from the very beginning. We have that opportunity now, and we can really not waste it. Thank you very much, Michele. Signe, up to you, 60 seconds. I think it's an admirable opportunity now for the young generation to co-design our policies, our healthcare systems, but also our research and innovation policies. So please take part in that. Thank you very much. And Susanna? I think it is time to think about the health system uh, of the future. Uh, resilience and digitalization uh, go hand in hand. And we need to make sure that uh, we work together, all the stakeholders. And of course, we need solidarity and to, to avoid uh, inequalities in our health systems in Europe. Fantastic. So 
Thanking you all, I would like to take the four words that I've heard the most today, which are, uh, you know, on one side, digital and of course, prevention, resilience. So that is the technical side. But on the other side, I've heard a lot of citizens, community, and uh, all together. That is something truly uh, fantastic to come out from a session like this uh, with uh, young people, uh, with policymakers, with experts, with professionals. So I would like to take the chance again to thank all of you, uh, to wish you the best of luck uh, from uh, all uh, uh, your future endeavors because uh, the life of young and uh, not only young citizens is in your hands. So thank you all of you. And now I leave it up to Joe and Elizabeth to conduct the, the next part of the question. And I would like uh, to say goodbye and thank you very much once again to Signe and Susanna. Have a nice day. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Good, I, I hope we haven't lost anyone. Um, so I think we have everybody here. We're in the breakout session. Thank you for bearing with the, the technology, everyone. Uh, hello, welcome to breakout session B on digital health. My name is Joe Litabarski. I'm the editor of debatingeurope.eu. Um, I'm just gonna check again if everyone, I think everyone's with us, you can all hear me. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Good, perfect, excellent, right. Um, okay, can we, can we start maybe just by taking a moment to kind of stretch or, or shake out your hands or legs? I know you're all working on healthcare issues, so you know the importance of not staying sedentary for too long, so get a bit of circulation. Just because I, I do want the breakout session to feel a bit different from plenary, okay? So if we just kind of wake up, that would be good. Um, and the idea behind the session is that we have a panel, we've got 11 young Europeans here, most or all of you, are involved in the field of health and we want you to agree on a common set of priorities and policy recommendations to European leaders on digital health and we've heard some other recommendations earlier in the plenary so this is really an opportunity for you to kind of um, talk about your own priorities what policy recommendations you, you have and now this isn't the beginning of the process the panelists have already been conducting pre-work. They've been thinking about their priorities and recommendations, and they've already submitted their ideas ahead of the session. So we're not starting from scratch. Uh, and uh, not only is the session not the beginning of the process, it's also not necessarily the end of the process. Uh, panelists are gonna have the opportunity afterwards to continue collaborating, to refine, expand, fill in further details and so on. So I hope that we get to fit, we don't have long. I can see there's a clock in the top right um, telling me we've got about half an hour. I, uh, that's not long at all. Um, uh, so it might be that we get a snapshot of the process today and there's further networking and collaboration to refine and that's fine, that's okay. For me, the thing that's most important about this session is the discussion about why certain priorities are more or less important for each of the panelists. Of course, we want a solid set of policy recommendations at the end of it, but the discussion and the debate are key. So if we don't reach complete agreement on all the priorities at the end, I think that's fine as long as we understand why some priorities are more important uh, than others to the panelists. Um, and obviously we want panelists to network together and continue their collaboration afterwards. Right, so we've got this document, we have four pillars and each pillar should end the session with two priorities and two related policy recommendations. Uh, pillar one is improving efficiency through digital health. That's treating patients more uh, efficiently, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of improved outcomes. So that's the kind of the meat of, uh, of this, this session. Pillar two is investing in infrastructure and interoperability. This is about physical infrastructure, such as internet, high-speed internet, but also human talent. So having enough data scientists, AI engineers, et cetera, and also partly about the right regulatory framework, though that also falls under, I think, pillar four. Pillar three is digital literacy, empowerment, and access. This is about digital skills. Uh, it's no good having all this fancy e-health technology if there's a digital skills gap and some health professionals or patients cannot access the technology. Pillar four is data management, security, and trust. Uh, now health data, that's come up again and again and again. You heard it in plenary. It's gonna be really key to a lot of innovation, uh, but citizens need to be able to trust their data is safe and secure and they've got control over it. And it's also about, as I said, regulation of data, AI, also improving cybersecurity resilience and, and so on. So let's dive straight into it. Let's start with the first pillar. Um, and go through them in order. I want to do a tour de table. So I'm gonna ask you all to introduce yourselves, all 11 of you. Um, and I'm also going to ask you each for one priority 
and related policy recommendation on the first pillar. So if you introduce yourself and give me your one kind of priority, basically, if you have a, any recommendation. I know not everyone had the opportunity to fill in every single recommendation, so don't panic. You can also choose to agree with another panelist's priority or recommendation. So you can say, you know, I, or if, if AI comes up or if, if uh, a kind of common data space comes up, oh, that sounds, you know, I, I think that that's the, the recommendation for me. That's fine. We, the idea is we want to refine these and get to two for each pillar. Uh, so please keep your priority recommendations short. I'm talking one sentence maximum, if possible. I know some of you went into more detail and that's really good and hopefully that comes out in the debate, but this is not necessarily the end of the process. We do have the opportunity to kind of refine afterwards. This is just the, the snapshot. So Thomas, uh, if you can hear me, I'm gonna ask you to start with you. Um, I'll um, ask you all, first, first, please introduce yourself and just give us your most important priority and, uh, and recommendation for pillar one. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, okay. Uh, so my name is Thomas. I work here at Digital Europe. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It was very interesting listening. Um, for the first recommendation about efficiency, I would already start talking about AI because, of course, we're young and we look uh, much ahead. And AI is definitely something promising also for efficiency in the future. Um, as a concrete recommendation, of course, we should encourage the uptake of AI. Um, but I would also want to say that we should um, look at AI as uh, something that can leap us ahead. And we should therefore also not look at AI as something that is just something risky per se. We should prioritize risk assessments and avoid one size fits all approaches. Okay, that's, that's my recommendation. Thank you. That's perfect. That's, um, so that's nice and short. Um, and again, you don't have to, if you agree with Thomas, if you think that AI should be a priority, then you can just say, no, I, I actually agree with Thomas. Or if you'd like to bring another one to the table, that's fine. Uh, Kezia, let's, let's move to you. Kezia, can you, can you hear us? What's your, if you could introduce yourself and give us your, your um, priority. Hi guys, my name is Kezia Parkins. Um, I'm a writer and journalist with a special interest in um, public health. Um, so yeah, I would have to agree with um, Thomas about AI. And I don't know whether this would come under um, this section or the second section, but I think definitely that um, having um, high speed internet across Europe is incredibly important. Um, yeah, would you say that was the second point? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know, that's. I think you know, that's a really, really. I, I can. Um, you know, this is one when we had the pre-work. We kind of. Yeah. I, I brought this up as a really key one, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think it might come under the second one. So it's <laughs> if if you'd like to have AI for the, your first, then we can hold on to um, uh, high-speed internet for the investing in infrastructure pillar. Yeah, fair play. But yeah, I agree with the AI. That's good. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on to Peter. Peter, what's your, if you introduce yourself and tell us your recommendation for Pillar 1. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Peter Sagner from uh, Hungary Samalweis University. And my major recommendation would be to empower uh, health professionals, um, increase their digital literacy. Because as uh, Hans Kluge said, they are the beating heart of the health system. And um, they are also the facilitators of uh, digital change. They are the trusted uh, source of uh, any information in the citizen. So for that reason as well, they are the crucial part uh, for adoption of digital solutions, but also to increase the uptake and trust at the community level as well. That's perfect. That, that, to me, that sounds like it would go into pillar three which is digital literacy, empowerment, and access. So is it okay if we hold on to that one um, and then we'll bring it up again in, in, in pillar three? Okay, perfect. Um, let's move on to the next. Uh, so after Peter, Duarte. So um, if you introduce yourself, Duarte, and give us your policy. Hello, my, my name is Duarte. I'm a public health resident from Portugal, both working in local and national level. And um, it's a bit different, um, the, the priority that I choose, because I, I think that the large scale training for health professionals, not just digital literacy at all, but real training on bas basic skills, on basic programs, on basic uh, digital uh, skills. And uh, actually, I, I just wanted to have that Yes, we, we can focus on, on younger uh, generations, but we have a large 
uh, amount of health professionals that are not young and they, they will still keep working with us. So we need to train them to be ready to, to navigate in this system. And regarding the recommendations, I will also support the implementation of AI and uh, automated systems to reduce uh, the burden on bu bureaucracy, registries, etc., to to reduce the burden on health professionals. Okay, I think that's a I think it's a really um, key point you make about uh, healthcare professional training, and it aligns nicely with what Peter said. Mm -hmm. I think um, if it's okay, I would move that into into the pillar three, not necessarily under digital literacy, as you say, but I think that that would fall under access, perhaps, or empowerment. Um, uh, so I think it's separate from digi general digital skills. I think uh, healthcare professional training, like regular training, is um, is a separate um, separate uh, recommendation. Um, would you would you be okay with that, Duarte? Yes. No okay. Worries. Good. Then that's perfect. So we have AI for for the first. Uh, we've, it's nice. We're filling it out. This is good. Uh, we're we're doing well, guys. We're we're um, on to Marlene now. Uh, so Marlene, if you introduce yourself and, and give us your recommendation. Um, hi, I'm Marlene, and I am member of the Youth Group of the European Patient Forum. Um, thank you for having me. And my priority is the reduction of bureaucracy to ensure adequate communication between healthcare professionals, um, patients, and the healthcare system to ensure adequate treatment and all around care. Perfect. And by the way, guys, um, it, feel free to disagree with me if, or disagree with one another. If you, uh, as I said, the, the pur purpose of the process to me is to have a debate, have that discussion. Oh, actually, I wouldn't put this here. I would, would put that there. So um, do say if, uh, if you think that a, a recommend, I'm putting a recommendation in the wrong place or, you know, the, as I said, it's the process that I think people, people um, are interested in. Um, so Marlene, um, and you put this um, in terms of reduction of, of bureaucracy, um, uh, uh, would that go into improving efficiency through through digital health? You think first pillar? Yeah, for sure. I think that's the main point that um, the healthcare systems are inefficient due to um, a lack of digitalization and everything going through mail and not being communicated to other okay. members of the care. That makes sense, I think. So kind of joining together um, different ICT systems in healthcare systems, maybe also uh, across Europe, but definitely like getting moving away from um, uh, kind of paper-based systems. And so many of these healthcare systems are still file and paper-based, it's, 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 it's fascinating. Uh, okay, let's move on to Evelina. Um, Evelina, um, what would you say, uh, first introduce yourself and, and tell us um, what your, your priority would be. Do we have Evelina? Let me check. Maybe not. In which case, if Evelina, then let's move uh, on to Yvette. Hi, everyone. Good morning or afternoon. I, I'm a bit lost of time. I'm Yvette Jakob calling you from Budapest, Hungary, and I'm the president of the European Patients Forum Youth Group. And my priority to this section would be making from more of an output side, making diagnosis and treatment more precise and more timely to patients through AI, through telemedicine, to chatbots, to reduct the reduction of uh, bureaucracy. So it would be mine. Okay, so this, this sounds like there's some overlap with Marlene's point. So kind of when you say reduction of bureaucracy, it's, it's digitization, right? So yeah. moving to digit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think digitize. Is it okay, Marlene uh, and Yvette, if we put that down as digitization? I mean, I think it's a really sure, important. Sure. Yeah, so um, basically moving away from paper based systems um, towards entirely ICT based offices, like your um, digital offices, um, digital exactly. systems. Okay. From paper based, from telephone based to online appointment scheduling and all. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a, a low hanging fruit and that's perfect. I think we can overlook it and we can say, oh, you know, I think AI is a really important one, but something as simple as digitization could have a huge impact. So I think it's a really important one. Okay, let's, let's put digitization then uh, under improving efficiency through, through digital health. And Eloise, um, you're up next. Um, do you have a, can you introduce yourself and let us know if you have a, a, a priority or a recommendation? Can you hear us, Eloise? 
Are you in the chat? No? Okay, so we'll go to Michaela. Um, do you want to introduce yourself and, and give us your, your priority? Hi, uh, it's Michaela Poises at the European Patients Forum. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, if I can maybe add one thing, uh, two, if I may. <laughs> uh, I think from the digital literacy empowerment and access, the same thing should go to, to patients and citizens as well, because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's two phases of the same uh, medal. Um, healthcare professionals cannot do this without patients, and patients cannot do it without professionals. So everyone should really be literate, empowered, and have access to this. Another point, as, as, as a key priority, even before AI, I think it's data. Because without data, AI, it's, it's, it's not going to work as well as it should. So um, the quality, unbiased, uh, harmonized data, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fundamental. Uh, and I think it is kind of a priority overall. But it, yeah, it matches. Like, I think it can go there. I think that I think you're absolutely right, and that's going to be really key. I think so. For me, um, I heard two. I heard um, not just healthcare professionals, but patient training. So I would put that, if that's okay, under digital literacy, empowerment, and access. And then in terms of um, data, I think that would fit under pillar four, data management. I, I, to me, data management, this pillar, it would include things like the regulation of data, regulatory frameworks. Um, it would include data sharing and the regimes under which data sharing takes place. So I wouldn't just talk about the kind of security, but also actually the, the kind of the rules and the like how the, the kind of legal framework within which um, data sharing can happen. So um, if unless you disagree, tell me, Michele, if you if you if you disagree, but I would put that those under pillar three and pillar four. Um, I think it's perfect. Great. Okay, we're almost this we're doing really well. Okay, so we're about we've got about 20 minutes and we've already kind of I think we've got at least one in every single pillar. So we're, we're actually ahead of where I thought we would be. This is good. Um, Evangelia, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and, and give us your, your priority? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm the chair of the European Health Parliament Committee of uh, Europe as Innovation Hub, and I am currently based in Munich, and I am finishing my PhD on epigenetics and metabolism. I have over 10 years of experience in uh, research, um, from basic research to more applied uh, translational pharmacology. So I've seen different stages um, of this part, um, including uh, patient engagement as well. So I would agree with uh, Duarte and Marlene uh, for the first pillar that uh, AI uptake should be a priority, but at the same time, um, if we don't have health uh, um, literate and digital literate patients and healthcare professionals, this cannot work. So I see it rather as a um, channel of uh, communication between the two where we have advancements in both sides, technolo technological advancements, but also that the pace of this advancement is um, at the right degree to be uptaken from the patients and the healthcare professionals so that they can collaborate with uh, each other. And also I would like to underline a bit more the role of the right mindset. Uh, so we, I think we need to work a bit more on that to be more open and innovative and um, take up maybe different messages um, uh, regarding healthcare and digitization. Uh, so, and definitely the um, working towards uh, European data space more eligible for open access, it's also a top priority, I think. Okay, that's interesting. That, that, and the European data space came, oh, I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if someone has their, their um, me coming through the speakers. If you switch to microphone, switch to headphones, sorry. 
Yep, that's good. Okay, so, um, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that, like, uh, that again, that aligns nicely with what some of the other panelists have said. So I think we're all, you know, what struck me so far as we've gone through this is how much overlap there is. And I was reading through the, the, the work, the pre-work that you sent me as well. Uh, and again, like a lot of this stuff, um, I think there's a, there's a sort of consensus forming on a lot of it, uh, particularly the importance of data. And then also this question of um, the training or, um, uh, you know, upskilling for healthcare professionals and also patients is coming up again and again. So I think there's, you know, it's clear that there's, there's, there are some priorities which everyone seems to share. Um, Angela, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, tell us your, your priority. If you're there, if not, or if you can hear me. Okay, I think if Angela's not here, let me make a note so that I don't call on her again. And if, um, has everybody had a go? Um, has everyone, th that was the list that I, that I had. I don't know if anyone hasn't had a chance to speak yet. No, I think that's us. Okay, good, perfect. So I think that we have, we've got a really nice foundation um, to kind of, um, uh, if we look at the, the, the kind of the, the, um, the uh, form that we're filling in or the, the template that we're filling in, I think we have something for, for everything. And as I said, it sounds like the, the common kind of priorities that are coming through are on the one hand data, like a lot of the, like, so for example, the technology AI, AI needs data. If you're going to have health AI, you're going to have act need, you're going to need access to data. You're going to need um, to be able to share data in order for, for AI to kind of do its, its job. Um, so that's going to be kind of really fundamental. And on the other hand, of course, um, digital skills um, and training for, for healthcare professionals and for patients. To me, these are kind of really leaping out. Um, I'd like what I'd like to do is kind of get into some of this in terms of kind of fleshing it out, like getting uh, you know ha these particularly the recommendations. So I think the the priorities I think are really good. They're strong priorities, and then the question is sort of how do we how do we get there? Um, we can maybe we should start with uh, pillar three investing in infrastructure and interoperability because it's only got one and maybe we can kind of flesh it out a little bit um, and, and add some uh, the other ones I think it's about a case of kind of almost cutting stuff whereas the, the investing in infrastructure we need to add something so let's start with that one there um, I think high-speed internet across Europe is clearly uh, you know, you're going to need that for a lot of these technologies to function and the European Union has committed to that. I think it's by uh, they want to have um, everyone having uh, one, is it one gigabyte? Um, every European home should have one gigabyte um, upload download speeds by 2025. I believe that's the, the case um, and they want to have high speed internet available in all railways and kind of public spaces um, that give it, I mean, we're in the, the context of the pandemic. We're all doing this from, from remotely. We would normally be doing this um, in person. Uh, so the whole, con everything across the world is moving digital. So perhaps we might as a recommendation think about, you know, do we think that these targets are ambitious enough, maybe given how the world has changed, the, um, the targets need to be made more ambitious, um, either by um, kind of increasing the targets or, or reducing the, 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 the time frame. Um, I don't know. Does anyone want to come in? Do, the, do they have ideas about how to kind of um, transform this uh, priority into, into kind of a solid recommendation? Just jump in if you want to. You can unmute your microphone and talk over me. That's fine. Hi. Um, I think something that's important to remember is that um, it's often the most disadvantaged people and the poorest areas that have a lack of access to um, high-speed internet or they might not have a smartphone. There are still millions and millions of people in the UK alone that don't have a smartphone. So it's kind of like, where do we go from there? So I think it's important to um, really up the investment in that and to kind of um, democratise the internet and digitalisation itself. Um, I think that's very important. Mm. And if you look at COVID-19, for example, um, it's the poorest and most disadvantaged people that are most likely to be affected by it. Um, and that in combination with... Um, having lack of high-speed internet mm -hmm. is quite a 
um, quite a damning com combination. So I think all of those things need to really be taken into consideration holistically. Um, yeah. I think I think there's a I think there's an absolutely vital point this because it, it goes into this question of access as well, doesn't it? Um, the the not just ensuring that that every that there is high speed internet, but that everyone can get it. Um, uh, and and you know the one of the kind of arguments um, for having uh, internet available in public spaces is that then it's more accessible to everyone. But then if you're in a public space, do you want to be sharing sensitive, if, if you're sitting in a train station, are you going to be sharing sensitive information with um, with a doctor, you know, having an e-consultation and so on? So I think there's also questions of privacy. Um, I mean, libraries, for example, have often been used as a, um, as a way for people to access um, uh, the internet if they don't necessarily have it at home. But on the other hand, um, again, it's a, it's a public space, is there the privacy? So I think it's, it's yeah, I think it's a really key point. Um, does anyone else want to come in on this one? I think, um, I think- No, if I, if I can. Please. Um, I haven't really heard anything about appliances yet. If we talk about AI and data, you also have to talk about the internet of things. And then we also have to look at how are these going to be invested in? Because when people need something put in their body for measuring, for instance, their sugar levels, this has to be reimbursed by the, by the system in the, national, uh, in the national systems. So maybe we can think of something that we can uh, recommend and also how we can put it as a priority because I, I wouldn't necessarily know in which one to put it now. Which one would you, yes. like, if, if you were going to, if I kind of pushed you, which one do you think it would kind of fall under? Because you're right, a lot of these fit under um, several of them. Yeah, so if you talk about investing, then I would say it's, uh, it's in investing in infrastructure and interoperability. Uh, it fits in there because it's about appliances and sensors talking to each other. So they need to be standardized and they need to be interoperable. And they also need to be invested in. So that's how I would see it there. But maybe somebody has a different opinion. Well, before I, I will ask other people, but can I just ask you also, how do you see this as, as and I think Internet of Things is absolutely fascinating, but how do you see it as relevant to like, healthcare data. Um, and I can see the, the link, but I just want to press you on it. Um, how do you see kind of your devices gathering healthcare data? Is it like, you know, you're, you're ordering, um, your fridge is informing people how much <laughs> junk food you're ordering? What would you see? No, I think this borders also um, M health. So mobile health is, um, there isn't, of course, there are so many different devices that you can be talking about. Uh, it could also be apps on your phone. Sure. So telemedicine and telehealth are also a part of this. This is a very big uh, source of data that will be created. Uh, yes. It's not necessarily the, the one that we've been talking about, but it's important nonetheless. Okay. Does anyone have any other thoughts on this? I think like this is, it's pretty key. It seems May I have Joel? Yes, go for it. Okay, reflecting on that, uh, on investments and where to invest, uh, what I really missed so far is um, is the decisions and how these investment decisions are made uh, based on evidences and uh, avoiding that the resources are not spent uh, adequately. So for me, um, using um, multidisciplinary approaches like health technology assessment and uh, this type of solutions to to lower the risk of um, wasting funds, which are critical even now in COVID uh, because um, the huge pressure will be there uh, from the economic viewpoint. So for me, it's uh, crucial to see even at macro, meso or micro level that which type of solutions, whether if it's AI, uh, mobile health, um, should be funded. Okay, and how do you have an idea how that would happen in, in practice? I mean, um, I think um, like evidence-based investment clearly makes sense, but um, particularly when you're looking at programs that are implemented, you know, uh, they might be have like a shared kind of EU national competency or be kind of implemented differently in different um, member states. Like, you know, what are you sort of thinking about in terms of how we can move towards more evidence-based investment? Yeah, I think here the real world data is crucial. So if okay. the countries can provide this, that's the first step. But of course, uh, the decisions should be made at the national level, um, tailored to the 
local settings, but the data should be provided from um, the European data space, let's say. That is fascinating. So we're, everything is interlinked here. So we're bringing data into um, kind of investment decisions here. So when you say evidence-based investment decisions, you mean that, that that healthcare data is available and then you can make decisions about where the money is going based on that. That's really interesting. Um, I'm going to open it up because we've got seven minutes. I just want kind of, we've only got five minutes rather. Um, we're coming to the end. So we've got it. Like I said, this isn't the end of the process. We'll have more time, but does anyone want to jump in with kind of thoughts? I, sorry, I wanted to um, agree with uh, Thomas about the uh, mobility and um, the current problem of what we see of the trend of decentralization of uh, hospitals and healthcare units. And then we see that patients have to travel hours and hours to um, reach a medical professional maybe. Uh, or to be treated um, in a different country even. So um, this is um, a priority and I think we should incorporate it um, in a way in the recommendations part. Okay, to me um, that sounds like it might fit in with um, uh, Possibly access, right? I think that um, if you're talking about mobility and um, uh, the trend towards decentralization of hospitals and healthcare units, then um, that's a that's possibly an access question. I don't know. It could also go into. I mean, a lot of these could fit into other ones. I think it's an important one to have, so we can maybe put it down and then decide after the the session where it should should rather go. Does anyone have any kind of final thoughts before we finish? We're about to wrap up. We've got a lot of stuff down here. Is anyone not happy with with uh, you know, what's on the, the, the template or would like to add anything? Yeah, um, I, I would. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Please go ahead and then, so um, first you and then Kezia, if that's okay. Okay, um, I think like a really important topic that we haven't discussed yet is transparency. So that um, it is always ensured that users understand what where their data is, who mm. is, where it's stored, how it is processed and who it is given to to ensure um, the right use of sensitive data. And talking about evidence-based, I noticed that especially for um, health management apps on your phone, there are a lot of them and there are mainly not evidence-based. And I think it is really crucial to ensure that if you manage your health as a patient, that you um, can rely on the information you get there. So there should be some kind of legislation that ensures adequate information. Okay. Um, and then uh, Kezia, you wanted to come in. Um, yeah, I was going to say um, about transparency as well. Um, I think, yeah, that's an important point that we haven't spoken about much. Um, and uh, educating patients around the importance of sharing health data. I think patients would be a lot less um, I think one of the main issues of all the, with digitization is mistrust in governments and um, yeah I think more transparency about why it's important how it benefits the whole of society blah 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 I think that's very important um, and in my notes I put like for example like the thousand genome project was a really good um, example of how um, uh, the public were kind of uh, it was everyone was interested in it and everyone could understand it. And I think it's a really good example of getting um, people involved and understanding the importance of data to improve the health of all people. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, I think like this has been really interesting, guys. Now don't, like as I said, this isn't the the end of the, the process. I think what was important is having this discussion and hearing your priorities. And what struck me and what I'll report to plenary is how much kind of overlap there was on certain things. I think data came up again and again as um, central. Um, the talk of uh, kind of training digital skills, access, making sure there's equitable access to, to high speed internet. Um, transparency has come up as a way of, of sharing this data that came up because um, uh, I think data is going to inform like all of the other pillars. It's going to inform policy, it's going to inform um, actual healthcare treatment, and it's going to inform um, this evidence based kind of uh, allocation of, of uh, investment. Um, and then AI, like it, to me, is sort of at the kind of top of the of the period. 
pyramid. Um, I think we're done. Like, does I don't know if we have time for kind of, I think we're all going to join automatically. Um, I hope everyone's happy with that. Uh, as I said, it's not like, don't worry. I know it was, I told you 40 minutes would go like that. In the end, we only had 30 minutes and it's, it's over. Um, so really this was about the, the, the debate. Um, I think we have 25 seconds now. Um, and I thought that was excellent from everyone. Right, let's count us down. I think we should now all join together and then we'll see what the other um, breakout session has been up to. And I'll present kind of just my thought. I won't go through everything, it'll take too long. I'll just present kind of my thoughts about how the discussion went. I see people adding last minute things in the chat. I'll cop copy this down. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Oh, and now we have 60 seconds, so that's okay. Um, does anyone have any last thoughts just before we join? Uh, last, uh, last thought from my side is that uh, uh, there is a need for um, investment in uh, data analysis skills for uh, middle-level decision makers or professionals who work at the, the Ministry of Health, for example. Um, my name is Lela Sulabarit. I'm from Georgia, uh, a middle-income country. So I, I, I have seen that there is the data in the Ministry of Health, um, but sometimes uh, there is a need of uh, skills, uh, this uh, data to be used for further decision making. So this is very important part and should be written somewhere. Uh, okay, again. that's perfect. That sounds like it very much sounds like it fits in with, with some of the things that have, that have gone about um, healthcare professionals and yeah. skilling. So that's really good. Excellent, guys, thank you very much. So uh, if we're ready to go, a warm welcome to our session on the future of health systems, where we will develop a citizens engagement campaign addressing healthcare resilience. We have um, active participants in this session. Please switch on your camera. And we will also have an audience. I would ask you to leave your camera switched off so I know who's actively participating. But a warm welcome to all of you and thank you for your interest. Quick note on Zoom, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, you may switch to gallery view of view, speaker view in the upper right hand corner. And our session will then also end automatically. Um, when the time is up, we will be redirected to the big panel so we won't have to do anything. Okay, so during the next half an hour now, <laughs> We will have a short round of introduction um, with the active participants. Uh, we will discuss what can be learned from the Fridays for Future movement for a health campaign. Thereby, we will develop uh, our own campaign. And then I would like to end our session with your vision for a better healthcare system. For a short round of introduction, I would like to call you by your name in alphabetical order. So I think Anna, brace yourself. <laughs> But just to introduce yourself quickly, um, which organization do you represent and um, what maybe at one sentence, why are you interested in health? What has motivated you? So maybe we could take this um, experience to um, put it into our campaign. But I can start, don't worry. I'm Elizabeth, I'm the editor at Debating Europe. I care about healthcare because I'm a mom. I want my kids to stay healthy. So that's a very personal reason, but I'm not a professional um, healthcare expert. So that's up to you. You bring all in all the expertise. Um, Anna, what is your organization and why are you interested in health? Yeah, I, I was surprised because you said alphabetical order and I'm S and I was and like, no, I should be the last one. <laughs> you said your last name, no. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Anna and uh, here today I represent the, um, the Young Coalition for Vaccination and Prevention and also uh, last year I was also participating in the European Health Parliament, so it's the, our Brussels bubble I think. Uh, why, do I, why am I interested in health? I think uh, it's uh, kind of uh, my interest from a couple of years already because I started uh, when I was studying law back in uh, Poland and in France. I really got interested into the um, healthcare and pharmaceutical law. So this is where I started to pursue my career here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next up is Bianca. You have to unmute yourself first. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bianca. I'm from Romania. I'm a healthcare professional. I'm a geneticist and currently working for an NGO. 
Um, I am um, interested in this field of uh, prevention and I've been working on some campaigns regarding personalized prevention. And I think this is a great opportunity and a great talk today about how can we uh, young healthcare professionals be more involved in this theme of prevention. Because from my point of view, at least in uh, the Central and Eastern Europe, this is a problem. Uh, we are more focused on, um, on a hospital-centric approach than on a preventative approach. And I think this is a great opportunity to be co-creators of uh, future resilient healthcare systems. Thank you. Borisava. Hi, everybody. My name is Borisava. I'm originally from Bulgaria, but I'm based in uh, Brussels right now. Uh, I'm uh, representing the European Patients Forum Youth Group. I'm the coordinator, and uh, I'm also a two-time kidney transplanted patient. So it's a lifelong condition, and I've been dealing with numerous healthcare systems and, and their amazing outcomes. And uh, I, I really want to make a change in everything that's happening uh, together with my peers. And I'm really looking forward to co-creating a more resilient future. Thank you. Next up, Erika. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Erika Alvarez. Um, I'm a One Young World Ambassador. I work in the healthcare sector industry for the past five years, but I'm, besides my work, I'm personally really passionate and enthusiastic about healthcare system sustainability. Uh, and the main point is because I think uh, healthcare, uh, health is the main right uh, and the enabler to fight for the other rights. So that's why. <laughs> Thank you. Fahim. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for having me. I hope my signal's good. We're in the middle of a storm in London at the moment, so if it does cut off, let me know. Um, so I'm a medical doctor by background, public health specialism. I was also a policy advisor to the NHS medical director. And um, over the last 10 years, um, I've been focusing on spinning out social enterprises, focused on address addressing the health needs of diaspora communities in the UK and Bangladesh through selfless. But more recently, after completing my uh, MBA at London Business School in Colombia, I've been focused on more impact investing and how we can invest in uh, healthcare enterprises. And uh, uh, also a, a one young world ambassador, uh, as uh, Eric mentioned. Thank, Thank you. you. Fanny. Yes, my name is Fanny Laura. I am based in Finland. Um, I'm a, representing the European Health Parliament here. I'm the chair of the Committee of Mental Health and Healthy Workforce. I'm also a patient advocate. I have history with a uh, major depressive uh, disorder and chronic illness. So that is my base for interest with, with uh, health, though I want to uh, not prevent sickness, but promote health and well-being regardless of the illness. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is Jana and uh, I am from Bulgaria. Uh, I represent the EDF Youth Group and uh, I'm also a member of the EDF uh, Youth Group in the EDF Board. And um, I'm myself a patient with uh, normal flu disorder, which is a rare genetic disorder. And uh, I'm very much interested in prevention because I believe that this is a, a key uh, factor to manage and uh, navigate uh, your condition. And uh, I think uh, we should discuss uh, more about it because I think it is really essential to develop uh, this procedure. So thank you very much for the invitation and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Um, I have a Joseph on my list, but I think you're Joe. Correct. Um, <laughs> you can call me Joseph if you wish. Um, so <laughs> uh, let's stick with Joe. Um, I'm here uh, in a personal capacity as the former president of the Youth Parliament quite a few years ago. Um, I currently work at the European Youth Forum. Um, why I care about health, I think that's probably the fault of my parents. They're both doctors, so I entirely blame them. And today I've been asked to wear my campaign hat. Um, so I've led campaigns on the environment and health and many other issues over the last 10 years. And that's where I'll be coming from. Well, that's perfect. Perfect in our group then. <laughs> uh, Luis. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Luis, a medical doctor specializing in public health from, from Portugal. And I'm here joining on, on behalf of the Young Coalition for Prevention and Vaccination. And actually, I think vaccination is a great way to improve uh, resilience of healthcare systems and obviously prevention 
as we are seeing currently, especially with COVID-19, as we are all waiting for a vaccine that will save us all. So it shows actually the, the importance of vaccination as a way to, to improve health systems and uh, patients uh, and everyone's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Amushic, but you have Samra in your name now. What do you prefer? Uh, my name is Samra, uh, okay. and music is my surname, or Mušić, as you wish. Okay. Uh, I work at the Ministry of Health of Slovenia. Um, I'm passionate about public health because I want to leave behind me more than just a career, and I want to participate in this fight for better tomorrow for me and for the generations uh, that will come. Uh, and I think this is really dynamic uh, field. It's really... Uh, pushing you to do better and to be a better person. So this is the reasons of me. Bye. Thank you. And I think the last one is Sylvia. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Sylvia. I'm Italian, but I'm based in Brussels. Well, I'm working for the time, which is our thing. Um, and we basically organized and decided to to come together for Young Voices uh, through the Young Coalition for Prevention and Vaccination that uh, I'm currently leading. And I believe health is a fundamental human rights, but it's especially important for young people to be more involved in this. So that's why I'm really interested. I'm, I'm really interested also to see uh, Young Voices to be more involved in political debate. Thank you. We have a Simone who wasn't on my list as well. Unmute. Unmute. The never ending story of unmuting, right? Uh, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, so my name is Simona. Uh, I'm uh, living in Belgium and Brussels as well, I'm one of those Brussels people. Uh, and I work at the European Hospital and Healthcare Employers Association as a policy officer. I'm looking into health workforce issues on occupational safety and health, labor market, industrial relations. Um, basically, my background with health started already in high school. I had a specialization in healthcare during my German Abitur. And since then it kind of started off in uh, European public health as a bachelor and international health as a master. And since then I've never done anything else but health. Uh, so this is very uh, much my, my thing. Um, I, I have to say, I'm a little, I'm very skeptical and I, about this whole uh, youth involvement thing. Um, and it's really interesting that you actually mentioned the, the um, Fridays for Future campaign, because I feel like uh, we've been left with something to deal with from the former generation. And now it's up to us. And will there be actually listening to us and actually do what we say? Um, so I'm very interested about this, uh, this analogy and what we're going to do today. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for this round of introduction. I think we can really take a lot of, of this motivation to put it into our campaign. And maybe we use as a thread through the next um, half an hour to discuss our campaign, what are they actually doing? Because this um, Fridays for Future movement, I would say is at the moment the most relevant youth campaign. Um, they really make sure that their voices are heard. So if we want to create something similar for health, what could be our narrative? What do you think? What is our call to action? I mean, they have this very, very clear narrative of villains and victims. They have the young generation who will have to face the consequences of the decisions we take today. And then you have the bad guys on the other side, like uh, former generations, politician, politicians in charge, CEOs. What would that be for health? Can you think of something that would work like that? There's a clear, simple narrative. So can I, yes, can I jump in quickly? Um, so first is just a disambiguation between a movement and a campaign. So a campaign tends to be very time bound. It's a specific moment where someone makes a decision. Whereas I think the, 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 the guys and girls from Friday from Future are, are aiming at creating a narrative change. So they're creating a movement, um, which is very different uh, strategic approaches to campaigns because campaigns you want to kind of create and bundle up a load of uh, citizen voice somehow and then release that at the specific time that it's best uh, take uh, the issue of uh, gay rights in Ireland for example um, and and then that's that's your change mechanism but a movement is something much more long term you're not necessarily trying to build so much anger you're trying to create something that sort of simmers for a much longer time um, so that would sort of be one one observation um, 
And the second, my second thing would be that uh, breast cancer is an amazing one to learn from um, in the sense of there was huge leaps forward in, 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 in um, the, the sort of fit started actually in the 19, 1900s, but it really took off whenever uh, 50,000 women marched on uh, Capitol Hill um, and uh, when the Clinton was in, in, in office demanding a screening for, for women. But that, that, that was a healthcare campaign. But what was interesting is it didn't mention the word health. It was all about women's emancipation, about women's right. It tied to a much larger social issue. So that's, that would just be one kind of input is like, what's, this, what's the larger social issue that you're tying it to rather than health? Because if you look at young people in general, you mean they've, they've been hit by the economic crisis, they've been hit by COVID, they're worried about if they're going to be able to get a job, they're worried about climate, they're worried about all these things. And like a niche issue like climate or like health has to tie into something bigger. Um, so that would be my first sort of question as well. Yeah, but I think that's why they asked us to look at this movement, which is also a campaign that they have these summits coming up and then they turn their movement into a campaign. And like you just described, some of the most um, successful campaigns might be part of a movement and not even mention health in the end. So can you think of something that could be either a movement or a very clear campaign towards a goal? I, I would like to step in with, with what you said about worrying. We're worried about things. And with that, I, I immediately think about mental health, about promoting mental health, about promoting openness about your uh, feelings, about your emotions. We have been uh, producing a policy recommendation in the European Health Parliament, not speaking about health, not speaking about mental health, which of, uh, often is heard as something that everyone is enjoying now. But we're talking about psychosocial safety and health, uh, safety in work, which is uh, which is something we need to have a work uh, place where we are not in constant stress, we're not in constant fear or an anxiety with time limits with, with everything that's going on because this is what's happening at the work, but it's also happening at home, it's happening with the COVID. We are fear, fearsome of getting infection, fearsome of, of infecting someone else. All of this stress is building on and we need to, uh, be open to talk about it. So this is... Would you say that this is um, this would be our mission for our health campaign if we look at the template? Or would it be if more you ask me that this would be yeah <laughs> this would be yeah if you just ask me I think I think just decreasing the stigma or just promoting openness about uh, your own emotions and, and just the feelings this this would be definitely so how could we achieve that? What do you think, guys think? If I uh, can jump, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I just want to. I just wanted to mention that I believe that it's important to raise awareness among young people that are not only young healthcare professionals that maybe know the topic very well, but it's important to try to find a tailored communication, especially maybe using social media mm -hmm. where you see a lot of misinformation and disinformation on the topics. You know, it's important to, to also target that kind of population and also people like for vaccination, for example, could be those hesitant people that are, are like a lot of more than Novax, for example. Um, so I really believe that one part of the mission could be to raise awareness among young people in general, starting from right, primary school, which is uh, very important, I think. And um, you mentioned social media, which makes sense if we target a younger audience, they basically get all their information using different channels. Um, what, what, who would be our natural ally to get to them there? Are there already different NGOs or actors in the field that reach out to younger people when it comes to health? Who else could we get on board? I mean, from my side, I can say that yeah, I think young and the, the coalition we are trying to do this um, with, of course, some support mm -hmm. from uh, different kinds of stakeholders. So it's important to have a varied number of stakeholders that can actually reach different kinds of population. But I think that young people for young people is extremely important. So first of all, starting with that. Um, so NGOs, any kind of organization for young people, it's, it's, uh, it's fundamental, I believe. Okay, thank you. Do you want to put that down in our transcript thank you so we have the stakeholders we have the young uh, and we have the ngos we have the 
groups that are already present in the field, maybe we want to add them and how to engage. And what else? Well, I'm lucky enough to say that I work in an environment where my senior colleagues are aware of the transmission of knowledge from them to me. So I would say that we need also mentors who can we trust and who will encourage us and also back up um, and will be our backup when we need them. It's not enough just peer to peer for my uh, opinion. And um, when I look at Fridays for Future, I think um, what really sticks is you have this very complex issue. You're sometimes overwhelmed with climate change as with health, where do you start? But they still manage when they campaign to have a very clear call for action, very clear messages. When it comes to prevention, what, what would you say are our priorities? What should be set in there? We just mentioned mental health um, issues, um, that prevention is, is key, maybe screenings. What else comes to mind? Yes, Fanny. Yeah, I'd like to uh, correct, not just preventing mental health illness, but promoting mental well-being. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't not everyone has mental illness, even though they have the symptoms of, of anxiety or stress of anything. So we're, we're talking about promoting health and really normalizing the subject of health. Like this is our daily thing. We all have mental health and we can take care of it. But that goes for, for health in general, right? So could yeah, it be our yeah. mission to take care about health or to get the message across that you have to take care of your health even before you're sick? Because who cares about health? And, and unless they're sick. So how do we get that message across? How could we get people involved? Yeah, I, I was thinking, can I, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, what is no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I was thinking, uh, for instance, in Bulgaria, we have this uh, kind of health hour at, at primary school. So once every week you get this uh, uh, pediatrician that comes into the school and explains about vaccination, sexual health, mental health, so on. So this is something that I feel like really, really builds up this, this uh, understanding of uh, the overall health of, of a human being and uh, how you should really take care of every step along the way and you shouldn't leave anything behind. So I, I think that's, that's a very, very good way to kind of prep <laughs> the whole situation in advance. So that would also be education. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. early education. Early education yes. and how to engage. That it becomes normal to talk about your health, even if you're not sick. Exactly. And that's what I would wanted to comment on that. I think that's a good idea because many young people think that health is something to be addressed later in life. Mm -hmm. and that not just that, it's just a responsibility for the uh, health system and uh, they should not be engaged if they don't have a reason. So. I think that we should start explaining them that health is their responsibility from a young age, of course, adapting the, uh, the discussion according to the age of the, the person. And about the priorities, I was thinking about some, um, about screening and um, about including some types of diseases that are, uh, let's say, um, now that there is this COVID crisis, we are focused on the vulnerable groups, on people with cardiovascular disease, let's say, and many people don't know that uh, some cardiovascular diseases have a genetic basis, such as familial hypercholesterolemia, and worldwide, nine in 10 people are not diagnosed. And this is a cause of premature heart attacks in young people. And maybe we should focus some screening campaigns on that, on finding targets, uh, target populations with different risk factors and expanding the risk factors, the traditional risk factors we've been looked at. So. But maybe also, I mean, the screening comes at a later stage, but, and there is definitely this genetic component, but healthy habits, healthy behavior, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. That kind of has worked in the past. Do you think that's still something powerful to use or is it, that's, do you need to find new messages? That's definitely something powerful to use. I mean, we have to continue to promote a healthy lifestyle, but mm -hmm. for, let's say this kind of population I was mentioned for people with FH, uh, a healthy lifestyle is not enough. They need early treatment. So they should yeah. be aware that there is this possibility of having another type of cause for his disorder. So maybe uh, raising awareness first, not mm -hmm. just going screening. So when I come to our template, our mission, it sounds like, is to raise awareness of um, staying healthy, not yeah. just focusing on these gloomy stories of diseases, but um, in order to prevent diseases, 
to um, stay healthy, keep a healthy lifestyle, do screen ups, do vaccinations, and um, also embed this in our healthcare system. Yeah, can I add something on that? Yes, of course. I think uh, I, I really like the, the concept of community-based care mm -hmm. because I think this involves all these healthy habits and culture. And I think it's also important to understand the role of uh, frontline health works. Uh, and I think, I don't know if maybe a priority or even a mission, but the understanding that health isn't started in hospitals, but in homes and in communities. Mm -hmm. So I think this um, community-based care is really interesting to, to make this approach. And I want to add another point, which is about to how to engage the early education point. I think we can also approach this in two pillars. Mm -hmm. One is more related to how we understand that civil society has an important role in shape policy, in participate in acti actively in, in, the, in the health uh, uh, discussions and, and, and policy making. Um, and also uh, an education about the complexity of healthcare systems, understanding how financial works, how uh, which are the responsibilities of the government and how I can play a role and, and influence all this, this complex health war, uh, system. But how do we break it down? How can it be less complex and more understandable for people who are not in healthcare or experts? I mean, we all have our own health. So in a way we can all relate, but how do we break it down then? How, what, what would you say, what would be your mission? How could people understand? Yeah, I think, no, go, go ahead. Like. Please. No, no, I was just thinking like, we all know from, from our childhood, we need to exercise. We, we do all of this. We need to eat well. This is, this is the standard procedure, but, uh, but how do we take care of uh, the, the relaxing? How do we, how do we wind down after they, this is something that we only think about when we are not able to relax, when we're not able to unwind. So, so this all, uh, and it's all connected also to physical uh, being, if you don't sleep well, you know you're going to be cranky. If, if you're not eating well, you're going to be cranky. But how do you notice this on your daily habits? Like, okay, this is what's happening all the time. So maybe I should look at not just how to mindful myself or do yoga, but actually this might be something about my eating habits. So, so just a holistic view on, on uh, health and, and also normalizing the subject of health. This is, we are all, we need to take care of not just a one aspect of health, but, but all, all different parts, not overdo it, but it's, it's a balance. And can I, can I, sorry, just to finish uh, and get back to your question. Uh, I think a way to break down the, these complexities mm -hmm. uh, maybe is using innovative approach. And I think you have a really, really good uh, catch on that. And that's a parallel as well to, to apply this for future. I think we, for example, use the, using, thinking on early education, using tools as gamification mm -hmm. is a really good uh, maybe a, a way to lower this complexity, uh, but there's a lot of different approach uh, that goes besides gamification, but really can use innovative approach to, to, to teach and to, to help this early education process. Okay, just coming back to the former comment, um, so for our vision is the holistic approach to health. Is that right? Can we summarize it like that? That it's not just one part, it's not enough if you, or my, it sounds too much like a burden, but isn't it nice to eat healthy and do sports and sleep enough? It sounds good, actually. It's not like you should do this, but if you have this positive approach, you, you don't really, do you really need the, all the bad stories or? I think there's something more that uh, we could also add to the vision and it's around yeah. the, making sure that actually what we are doing now at the moment, we're using all the tools that and the possibilities that we have now in order to impact then the, the world, the healthy world that we will have in the future. So just uh, thinking about, we can actually now do the exercises, we can now get the vaccination and it will enormously impact our world of tomorrow.
So I think this is also the kind of vision that uh, we could promote here. Mm -hmm. And the, the other idea that I had, it's, uh, it's around, I don't know if it's mission or if it's how to engage. It's something about, because we are talking about the voices of the young people, so actually how we do it, it's, it's around kind of almost reversing the conversation. It is something that we are already trying to do it at this gosh time session. It's like giving the voice to young people and then the older ones and actually the ones that are currently more in power in the government to make the change, to listen to us. So I think it's also about kind of putting in place the right tools and the, the ways to exchange with the young people on a more um, regular basis. Thank you. If I may, um, just to link this in with health financing, um, I think it's important that we educate um, the youth from a financial literacy point of view as to how much they're contributing um, in terms of employment and the future of their own personal spend in health and how this will impact them in the future um, if they're less healthy. Um, so especially in developing countries where it's you know, more direct and that you're going to have to put up catastrophic payments and sell your house to fund healthcare in the future. If you, if you live an unhealthy life, you're not unable to, to, to live a healthy life. Or on the other side, if it's more indirect and your, your health system is financed by your own taxes, um, having that, you know, that financial literacy and linking that with health and being able to educate um, younger people as they, as they progress and develop, uh, I think it's um, uh, quite important to, to factor that in. So also the, the issue of where is the money coming from, I think, is very important to look at. Okay. How much is our health worth? How much do we personally want to spend? How much of the GDP should be spent on health? I think this is something that should also be part of a campaign to get that right. Yeah. And build, building a bit on what Anna, Anna said, um, one of the questions you've got to ask yourself is what's the unique what, what's what is youth bringing which is unique in the sense of using digitization well and things like that could be old young whatever so like what's the unique bit of of, of youth voice um and there's an emerging theme throughout a lot of the um environmental campaigns which is intergenerational solidarity so so the idea that it is a um a, a philosophical fundamental moral right that old people make sure that the system is fit for younger people. Um, and I think that that could be an interesting hook that we could, or you could uh, build into some sort of larger movement around health and um, the young. Um, and, and one of the key points of change that you could focus on is, as, as the commission said, the conference on the future of Europe will be a large democratic exercise next year. And the, the, trying to, to, to canvas the democratic part of that, um, that 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 you, know, you you do a large scale exercise, lots of focus groups, lots of different countries, uh, and deliver that in some type of package to the conference of the future of Europe is a is a possible change mechanism to um, show that number one young people care, um, and number two that they've got ideas for for how to change it um, because obviously the inertia in the current health system is staggering because pharmaceutical companies massively profit from the status quo as do doctors as does pretty much everyone and no political person will take a risk to change it into something which is obviously could be better. Um, so yeah, that would be a thought. Great, yeah, thank I you. Th I think this uh, uh, solidarity- We uh, only have uh, two minutes left. Let's put the solidar solidarity um, part also in, maybe to our call to action. So everybody should be involved. Would that be the right place to put it, Joe? I think also if I may add to that, uh, uh, engagement of uh, young people and uh, young patients and strengthening uh, the connection between young patients and uh, healthcare providers is also an essential part of prevention because young people should trust their medical doctors so that they can uh, receive better information and they can um, care about their condition. And uh, I think involvement of young people in all sectors and uh, in all kinds of debates is uh, essential and it's something which we should all definitely work for it. Thank you. So a sense of empowerment to patients and also younger patients. Also better cooperation between right. young patients and young healthcare providers. Yeah, I just wanted also to add something in the importance of huge policymakers uh, for preventive measures, really to, because right now we have only 3% of the total health expenditure on prevention and health promotion. And it's really important to huge policymakers to understand that 
cure is better, that better prevention is better than cure, actually. So I think this will be part of the call to action. Yeah, and that's also, also a good slogan for a poster. I think, I young, think our time is up. I'm so sorry. Yes, I minutes. think also investment for future. Sorry, was that you for Sorry. <laughs> sorry. So thank you so much for your ideas and your discussion. I think that you could really pick it up from here and develop a campaign, maybe even a movement. Um, I think we will be kicked out in two seconds. So see you on the big panel. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, we don't have long. So thank you very much. I think we've all returned from the breakout sessions. So um, we have five minutes just for me and Elizabeth to present uh, like a snapshot of what took place during the sessions. I'm, we're not going to be able to list everything. So I just wanted to tell everyone um, the documents that we've been working on, the templates that we've been filling in will be available for um, participants to kind of access online. We'll have those available. And as I told the, the panelists during the session, it's not necessarily the end of the process. We want panelists to keep kind of networking and, and, um, and collaborating. So I'll just give you a quick snapshot of what was discussed during the debate. What struck me was how much overlap there was, how, um, how much, uh, the young people had been doing kind of pre-work before the sessions, but really like there was a lot of shared uh, priorities, which I found interesting. Data was um, key for, I think everybody, um, and, not, and it informed like all of the other pillars that we were working on. So, so um, data came up, not just in terms of uh, sharing data for AI development and research uh, for health AI, but also uh, for um, uh, informing kind of where investment should go. So through, uh, through policy uh, in data, informing policy decisions and investment decisions, um, access to data, sharing data was really important. And the flip side of that was transparency, having uh, patients feel that they're and citizens feel they're in control of their data they know how their data is being used. Um, so that was really, really emphasized. Um, skills, like the, so we did talk about the kind of the, the technology and the, the, the hardware, but also the kind of the, the skills, digital skills, and uh, the importance of providing regular training for uh, healthcare professionals and also making sure that patients um, have, have skills to avoid a kind of digital skills gap. Um, and uh, I think a really important thing that came out was, um, uh, you know, the fundamentals of this, of all, a lot of this technology is going to be based on um, access to high speed internet. So there was, uh, I think, a desire to see more ambitious targets in terms of rollout of high speed access, uh, internet. And again, this question of access came up. Um, so making sure there's not a digital divide in terms of, um, uh, you know, income level, uh, so that people who uh, are from wealthier backgrounds are able to kind of afford the higher speed internet and other people are kind of excluded from that. So I think that, that, that those uh, really kind of shone through as, as things that um, everyone seemed to agree with. AI, I think a lot of people were really excited by the opportunities afforded by AI in terms of things like genome sequencing and so on. So that came up. Um, uh, I think my takeaway was that, that Europe should be more ambitious um, uh, given the pandemic, the situation has changed. So it had set targets in the run-up to the, to the pandemic, but the pandemic has really kind of scrambled things. Uh, and so be more and more ambitious on a lot of these, these, um, these issues. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth to let her kind of present her session very, very briefly. And just to say, again, the full documentation and the video is going to be available for all participants. Uh, thank you, Joe. Well, we also had a very inspiring session and we discussed maybe the starting point of a campaign to be developed on an earlier, uh, later stage. But um, I found it really interested that, interesting that most of our participants became interested in healthcare because of very personal reasons. And I think then we could use these stories and to keep um, or to look at that motivation when designing a campaign or maybe even a movement like Fridays for Future. We need um, post personal stories um, for a narrative to work and to inspire others. And um, what I think all the participants all agreed upon is that it is key to raise awareness of how important prevention is. You have to take care of your health before you get sick, um, including vaccinations, screenings, and in general, uh, healthy behavior. So you shouldn't also say, if you don't do that, you will end up being sick, but rather have this positive message. If you stay healthy, it's good for yourself, you feel better, uh, you'll save a lot of money in the end. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, this is the message that should get across in our campaign, that you have this holistic view on health, 
that it's not just food, it's not just um, exercises, but you can do something for yourself before you're getting sick. And that this should also be part of our future healthcare systems to become more resilient. So thank you for the discussion. I would just like to make a, a comment that I'm very excited and very proud to see uh, all of the young people having such an active stand in these debates. And I know for sure this is the, the beginning of something um, more. When I see all these logos on the screen, I'm really proud that we um, are with so many representatives from so many youth groups here together. Uh, and I'm sure this will be a network that we'll, um, we'll keep alive and we'll make sure um, that for in the digital group, um, these priorities will be pushed forward and in the prevention group uh, to make sure this can be a start of a potential campaign for the youth. Um, so that's just what I wanted to say. I'm really proud of all the participants and thank you so much for joining today.